good morning and welcome everybody for the regional focus forum for Latin America and the Caribbean. We're going to discuss about productive development in Latin America and the Caribbean and the future strategies related to it. It is such an honor for the annual investment meeting to welcome you all and our honor panelists to this very special session that has the main objective of strengthening this bridge between Latin America and the Middle East and all the activities regarding that. Also, well, productive development is such a crucial uh, subject and concept for, under for understanding economic growth in the region. And well, it is, it is such an honor for me to introduce this very special panel and our moderator, Ms. Maria Camila Moreno, she is the Executive Director of the Free Trade Zone Association of the Americas, and she is from the Republic of, of Colombia. Maria Camila, welcome. Well, good morning, everyone. Nice to see you in, in our third day, fourth day, actually, of, of the annual investment meeting. Thank you very much for this distinguished, this is really distinguished panel. And, and it's an honor for me to moderate, to moderate today. So I'm going briefly, um, to tell you the, the bios of, of everyone that is here present today. Uh, we have the presence of High Excellency Luis Alberto Castiglioni, Minister of Industry and Commerce of the Republic of Paraguay, and former Vice President of the Republic of Paraguay. Um, thank you for, for joining Vice us, President. Minister. Uh, we have Mr. Fabricio Operti from Uruguay, who was appointed manager of the integration and trade sector in the Inter-American Development Bank since 2018. Fabricio, nice to see you again. We have Mr. Jaime Guillén uh, from Mexico, senior board executive, investment professional and entrepreneur with over 30 years of energy and infrastructure development, financing, management and operations experience globally. Thank you, Jaime, for coming. We have with us today uh, Mr. Wagner. Oh my God! Come, um, he is the he has the executive function of global CEO of BMG with advisory activities in the government relations and international trade teams in Brazil. Just one uh, question. Who speaks Spanish here? Can you raise your hand? Okay, great. Okay. All. Okay. E Portuguese? Oh, ótimo. Ótimo. Um, and we have with us Mr. Ignacio Corlasoli. Has a, a long, successful professional career in the Inter American Development Bank, CAF. He has served as an operations consultancy, country coordinator for Belize and IT, um, Central America, Panama, Dominican Republic, Consular of Uruguay, Pal Paraguay, Bolivia, um, and also he recently worked in Colombia, and now he's based in Madrid. So as you see, we, we have really, really a uh, very, very distinguished panel, and we're going we're going to discuss today about the Latin American and GCC relationships. So, um, for the first question, Fabricio, I, will, I would like to, to start with you, um, asking you about the current state of bilateral trade with Latin American and the GCC countries. And I was looking at the figures, and to be honest, I was a little bit surprised because we have from the Latin American countries to the GCC, we're only exporting $14,000 million, uh, figures of 2022. And for reference of all of you, all the Latin American countries were exporting $665,000 million, which represents only 2% of our total exports of Latin American coming to the, to the GCC. So I would like, did you briefly, and, and this question is, is a, is a, um, it's a general question to, to, to all the panelists. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm going to start with the, with the minister, of course. Um, so what, what, what can we look forward to strengthen these bilateral relations? 
for me? Yeah. Okay. I am going to speak in, Sp in Spanish. Sí, todos. All the auditorium is Spanish. <laughs> Creo que definitivamente la realidad nos habla de economías complementarias. Latinoamérica y el CCG tienen economías absolutamente complementarias. Latinoamérica básicamente es un gran productor de alimentos y un gran industrializador de alimentos. Y los países del CCG son países que requieren imperiosamente de seguridad alimentaria. Tenemos un campo propicio que nos va a permitir un, la posibilidad de un crecimiento mutuo de comercio en esta, en esta área que puede hacer que el desarrollo de nuestros países se acelere muchísimo. Tenemos la complementariedad también por parte de, en el área energética, en general, nuestros países en América Latina, mi país es un importador nato de petróleo, de derivados del petróleo, que aquí abunda, por ejemplo, eh, es, forma parte integral y fundamental de nuestro proceso de desarrollo y aquí tenemos como complemento a países que producen y que también pueden exportar a Paraguay y a todos los demás países. El desarrollo tecnológico que se ha llevado adelante en los países del CCG, por ejemplo en Emiratos Árabes Unidos, es impresionante. Y nosotros necesitamos transferencia de conocimiento, transferencia de tecnología para aumentar nuestra productividad, por ejemplo en el área de la seguridad alimentaria, en el campo de la agricultura. Aparte, de en, el, en, en otros campos como en el campo financiero, por ejemplo. Es decir, tenemos economías absolutamente complementarias y ayudadas inclusive por una, una realidad que hace a la presencia de, eh, de, de ciudadanos de estas partes del mundo en América Latina. En América Latina probablemente haya la mayor cantidad, posible, la mayor cantidad de ciudadanos descendientes de árabes en, después del, de, 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 del mundo árabe. De hecho, mi esposa, por ejemplo, es nieta de un libanés, o sea que estoy hablando con conocimiento de causa. Entonces, pero ¿cuál es, cuál es la dificultad que yo estoy encontrando? O sea, ¿cuál sería una barrera a derribar? Tenemos que descubrirnos más, tenemos que insistir en, en acciones concretas para, de, para el descubrimiento mutuo que se ha iniciado. Estamos en una etapa incipiente de descubrimiento. Paraguay ha de ser todavía un, una, una incógnita en general, ¿verdad? Y los países del Golfo, de, de aquí del Golfo también para nosotros. Pero nosotros hemos, dado, hemos tomado esta decisión. Nosotros dar los primeros pasos y en ese sentido hemos dado los primeros pasos y hemos firmado hace muy poco tiempo acuerdos de, para evitar la doble tributación con Emiratos Árabes Unidos. Acuerdo para protección recíproca, es recíproca de inversiones con Emiratos Árabes Unidos. Y acabo de firmar un acuerdo con mi colega, el doctor Tani al Sayudi, director, ministro de Estado para Comercio Exterior y Promoción de Inversiones de Emiratos Árabes Unidos, un acuerdo marco que nos va a permitir el desarrollo de nuestro relacionamiento económico en todos los campos y fundamentalmente enfocado en dos áreas, seguridad alimentaria y energías limpias y renovables. Quiero eh, culminar diciendo, el tema de tener iniciativas, acciones para descubrirnos mutuamente, para que los países del Golfo descubran las potencialidades de los países de América Latina y los países de América Latina descubran todas las potencialidades de los países del Golfo, eso va a dar ocasión en la construcción de una amplia carretera, de una autopista que nos va a llevar a obtener beneficios mutuos en un dinámico relacionamiento económico en el área de comercio, en el área de inversiones, en general en todo lo que sea el, el, el devenir económico. Mucha, muchas gracias. En inglés. Bueno, mucha, muchas gracias, ministro. Um, 
and, and, and as you were, I have to switch because there are some people that are actually okay. non-Spanish speakers. Okay, okay. Okay? Um, so, two main points uh, to take away, and I guess that the, the other panelists are going to complement, but we're starting with were complementary economies, and you can completely see it on the trade flows, um, well, food security, and renewable energy, which we're going to, to ask about that after. Um, Fabricio, let me, let me ask you regarding the same uh, a question, and from your perspective of trade um, and, and the trade flows and all your experience that you have with the region, how we can actually strengthen more these relations with the GCC countries? Sure, Maria Camila, and um, thank you first of all for the invitation to this year's annual investment meeting. It's a, it's a privilege, a, pre a pleasure, an honor to be representing the Inter-American Development Bank in this important meeting, and I would like to extend my deep gratitude to this amazing city and Emirate of Abu Dhabi, uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here. And thank you, Minister Castiglioni, as well, for your words. You know that the IDB is an ally of Paraguay. We believe in Paraguay. We've done many things there, yeah. a country of opportunities. Sí. So uh, I fully uh, support your words uh, before. Yes. Let's thank see. Uh, first, Trade and integration are good for economic development. Um, in fact, at the IDB, uh, we estimated that between 1990 and 2010, in those 20 years, those two decades, when Latin America and the Caribbean negotiated most trade and investment agreements, that process of trade liberalization contributed to 40% of GDP per capita growth. Just imagine, if you're a government official, a policy that is so pro-growth, so anti-cyclical, eh, and so such a, 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 a channel, an avenue of, of opportunity. So trade means growth, means employment, means value added. That's, that's very important. So, but w what's the picture? Where do we stand, Latin America and the, the, the Gulf Cooperation Council countries? Um, we would say that the trade is limited, so it's small, and it's very concentrated, but with enormous potential because of those complementarities. Yes. So we depart from a basis that is low and it's still concentrated. About three quarters of the trade occurs in only three countries, which are uh, Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico. Um, the bilateral merchandise trade in data for 2021 between our regions total 23 billion of which 8 billion are exports from the countries of the Gulf to Latin America and the Caribbean and 15 billion are uh, exports from Latin America and the Caribbean to, to, to the Gulf. Um, so that's sort of where we stand. Um, we think that uh, and our research that we carried out uh, says that we could increase this trade by almost a hundred percent by, by uh, as much as 19 billion dollars by concluding trade agreements and increasing our bilateral diplomatic commercial presence so Minister, you're on the right track. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we did the numbers, we did the econometrics, and we concluded we need more trade agreements. You know, many are in the pipeline, they haven't concluded. So we need more, you know, all the people that are here, including the ambassador from my country who's here present, and I thank you for, for coming. I'm from Uruguay. Uh, and, and all the diplomatic presence, that's very important. We need we need th that promotion is very human you know we have zoom we have teams we have all these virtual platforms that we have to sit down and do business and and the people to people exchanges are keying that where are the opportunities um, we find that you know we're living in a very particular world uh, the war in ukraine sustained population growth the energy transition and growing digitalization those are forces no? that are driving a growing demand for food, eh? we talked about food security, energy, and digitalization, knowledge-based services. And I know I will refer to that in, 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 in the second question. But I would 
point out to those particular sectors. Latin America and the Caribbean is destined to, place, to play a role in the world in food security, not only in the region, in the world. We feed twice our population. Mm -hmm. We feed 1.3 billion people right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have 50% of global diversity, 30% of the water reserves. So we are definitely destined uh, for that. In, in the energy and renewable energy sector, um, the, 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 the lithium triangle, which is Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile, hold three-fifths, three-fifths of the world's lithium. So if you think about electric batteries and about lithium, eh, you have to think about our region, about Latin America and, and the Caribbean. So energy, energy, energy transition, key aspect. And then eh, knowledge-based services. And this I like very much because these are the services that it's value added, it's, it's video games, it's animation, it's software, um, it's technology, it's artificial intelligence, it's all these uh, platforms in which our region with our young population and a very entrepreneurial one, I think many things can also be done with this region. So I would start from, from there, as you see, uh, with a very constructive approach because I think there's a lot of opportunities out there. Yeah. Thank you very much, Fabrizio. And as you mentioned, trade is growth. And here, uh, being, being this day seen in Dubai and in Abu Dhabi, Sharha, definitely it's an example abroad, like um, how to open a market. And, and we see it also in, in our region with all these free trade agreements that you were mentioning, the importance of strengthening diplomatic relations. Um, and, and very interesting, and I have to mention because I represent the Free Trade Zone Association, that actually the third most important sector here are free trade zones. There's oil, there's tourism, and it's free trade zones, which is linked directly to, to trade. Um, of course, I, uh, we, we all agree about the diplomatic relations. We're very shy, let's say, and, and uh, we also congratulate the um, minister that, that you're doing in advance, you're taking the lead in the, in the region with all these new agreements you're doing. And, and Fabrizio, I'm going back to you after for the knowledge-based services, because here I think we have huge, huge opportunities. Um, Jaime, so from your experience and based um, on, on all this infrastructure um, knowledge you have, how we can integrate more, especially for the investment, for trade, all the experience that, that Mexico has maybe to export here or from the knowledge they have from infrastructure here to our region that lacks a lot of infrastructure in some countries? Right. Uh, thank you, Maria Camila. So, I mean, I'm going to give you the, the investor's perspective. I've, I've been in, in the investment community for 30 years and... Uh, you know, we, we look at the investment either by GCC countries in Latin America or Latin American sort of companies into the GCC, and we're just scratching the surface. Uh, I mean, you gave us the figures, but we see it day to day. I mean, we regularly meet with U.S. investors. We regularly meet with Chinese investors. We meet with European investors. Uh, GCC, once in a blue moon. And, uh, but we see that changing. Uh, we do see you know, some of the in investors out of the Middle East starting to invest through third parties, i.e. through companies either in uh, Europe, companies in the United States that are then investing. Uh, that's an important step because the investors in GCC don't know the Latin American markets. They know what they read in the Financial Times, they know what they see on CNN, which is not the way to actually understand and experience that country. So the fact that they're actually starting to invest, putting, dipping their toe in the water, to us it's an important and major first step in sort of, you know, uh, uh, creating uh, then a direct investment by the GCC investors. And we're starting to see that. I mean, yesterday I met with several investors that are now actually investing directly. It's a limited uh, portfolio. But once they make one investment, you see them quickly make another. And then that just became, becomes a snowball effect. It just grows and grows. Obviously, right now, it's, a lot of it is focused on Brazil, which is the largest economy in Latin America. 
also on, on Mexico because of the you know, onshoring and nearshoring that's happening right now. But they're starting to look at other countries. They're starting to look at Colombia. They're starting to look at uh, Chile. They're starting to look at Peru, despite all the political turmoil. So that tells you that they've gone from beyond kind of reading headlines and actually trying to understand where is the opportunity. And I think many of them were forced to look at new opportunities because of the crisis in Ukraine, the geopolitical situation between China and the United States. And I think Latin America is going to be a net beneficiary because as they go out and look at alternatives to the supply chain, as they look at alternatives for investment, I mean, you had a lot of GCC countries invested in Russia, in Central Europe. Uh, a lot of them pulled that capital out. Why? Because of that, the uncertainty. They thought it was more certain than, let's say, Latin America, but then they discovered that it's not. But it's not only the developing countries that you know, have been uh, uh, in turmoil. The GCC is a big investor in the UK, and you cannot tell me that the UK is more stable than other countries around the world. I mean, it has had quite a number of changes in government. Uh, and again, that's been a wake-up call that, you know, that there is actually more risk and that they're used to risk, that they just don't understand it. Uh, so, you know, we're making the effort of actually coming here, looking for capital, but our big uh, effort here is actually just simply to educate, to uh, let them understand what happens when there's a change in regulation, that yes, there's a change in regulation, but things can still get done. There may be a change in government, but there's still certain institutions that remain and things can get done. I think most of us look at, look at, at someone like us, which we manage seven funds in the region, and they ask us, you know, how we've been able to successfully invest over time, and that is simply because we're on the ground, we've taken the time to learn about each of the countries, each of the governments, each of the challenges, and we invite them to actually come with us so that they learn because they, they want to invest. They just have, they're just, you know, it, that first step is the, the difficult step for them to actually make. But so in, in, in summary, what, no, what we're trying to do is make sure that they really understand the market, getting to, you know, the, put a toe in the water, and from there, get them to actually make bigger investments. And they will. I mean, Mubadala announced a big investment in, uh, to Brazil just recently. Uh, we do know that several other of the GCC investors are actually investing in the hospitality sector in Mexico. Many are investing in the manufacturing sector. So you see that, uh, you know, uh, all of a sudden happening. Now, what can GCC bring to Latin America besides capital? Knowledge. Gracias. I was here in the early 90s, and I would say 90% of the buildings you see today were not here. Uh, the airports in the region uh, would have never been considered, or no one would thought back then that the GCC countries would have the largest and best airports in the world. No one thought GCC would be the capital of capital that could rival London, New York, or Hong Kong, but it has. And that's been in 30 years. You know, that knowledge is here. And the companies that are here and based here have grown from being local companies, whether it's the oil company, the electricity company, the uh, waste company, to being global companies. They've taken that step. So can they bring that knowledge to Latin America? Absolutely. And as someone said, I mean, there is a, a, a link and similarities between where GCC was before and where Latin American is today. And they can actually help and complement and accelerate Latin American's growth uh, by not only investing, but bringing that technology and that uh, uh, ability to scale up from where they were 30 years ago. Yeah. So. Thank you, Jaime. And I, and I will compliment that is, is, is knowledge and vision. And sometimes we lack of vision in our, in our countries, no? That's my, my personal opinion, but the, the lack of vision. And here you can see what is the plan in 15 years, in 30 years, and they comply. They, actually, it has to be ready like six months in advance of what they actually, uh, actually say. And regarding the, um, the infrastructure that you, are, that you were mentioning that they're, they're investing, uh, I was very surprised of seeing the DP World Caucedo in Dominican Republic and also in Ecuador. So 
it, it, they're, they're slowly, as you said, they're, they're with, a, with little steps, but at least they're, they're starting to invest in our region. Um, and, and again, and I think it complements with Fabricio's point about education and how to educate if there's not diplomatic presence as much as we would like, since they're going to be our ambassadors to, to, to tell all the good stories about our, our countries. Um, I would like to, to go to Mr. Wagner, and since you work directly with companies um, and Brazil, and you're seeing all the region and all the political risk, it's, it's a company based for political risk. If you can give us the vision of how they see us, the GCC countries, how they see us to invest. What's their perception? Jaime already mentioned, but since you're in the political, very truly, <laughs> I know this is very diplomatic, I'm not the most diplomatic one, uh, but let us, let us know what is their vision. Thank you, Maria Camila. Sorry. It's a pleasure to be here. It's the third time that BMJ is represented here in, in AIM, so it's very, very good to see how uh, it's growing and how the, the presence of our countries, our colleagues here, are growing too. So, first of all, uh, it's funny because uh, uh, commonly it starts with trade and then the investment comes. The relation between uh, GCC and Latin America uh, is not like this. The investment came first and the trade is still quite small. So I think we, we have a, a good opportunity in trade. It's still very concentrated in, in five or, or six family products, but we, we have a, 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 a growing trade flow, so I think we have a role to diversify. Talking about investment, uh, I think the political risk is, as you said, uh, a, a, a great risk, a, a great issue here because, you know, uh, the stability of the institutions uh, is crucial, is the key uh, point when you are talking about a product that the, 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 the payback will, will come in 30 years, in 50 years. So I think we have a, a, a challenge here because we are democracy, we are young democracies in Latin America, and uh, the, the institutional uh, uh, mature of these, these countries is still in, in, in process. I, I see in Brazil, for example, we had a, a, a changing government right now. We had a, a very different uh, government last, in the last four years, and uh, we now have a, a left-wing party in the power, uh, but what we, we, we must preserve is the stability in the institution. So uh, we have many cases, we work with many companies from GCC, and uh, of course the, some investors are af afraid about what the change in, le in legislation we will see for the next four years. For example, the labor law ha had been uh, 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 change in the, the last have been changing for the last four years so probably we will have a change uh, during this new government but uh, it must be clear what is the perspective for the investors and I think there is many opportunities in this changing government for example in the environmental uh, uh, sector, I think there is a huge potential uh, because we are feeling the pressure of our consumer, espe especially in agriculture goods. Uh, for example, Europe, they will impose a, a trade barrier by this year. Uh, the carbon tax and the Deforestation Act that will be in place in the next semester probably will affect our exports from Brazil and we will need investors to adapt our production, uh, especially in agriculture, but many others, to still uh, 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 
exporting to these regions. So I think GCC can be a key partner in this in, in this shift in our production, uh, and I and I, and I think that the the infrastructure is is something that we need and. Uh, GCC has the knowledge and has the inv the investors to to be partnered in the in, in this sector too. I think uh, nowadays uh, the the importance of GCC and UAE is is uh, clear for for the Brazilian government. Uh, Lula was here two years ago, and he he went to UAE before going to Europe. So it shows how important. Uh, the region is for Brazil. Uh, well, I think we, we have many other issues to, to talk uh, later on, but uh, to be clear, I think the environmental and uh, the pressure that we are feeling from our consumers' market may uh, provide a huge opportunity to investors and to grow the, the relation between DCC countries too. Great. Um, Thank you, Wagner. And, and very, very important when you, what you mentioned about the legal stability and actually for all the investors that come asking for free trade zones is the first question we always receive. Like, how is the legal stability? Do you have stability contracts? Some have, some others not. Well, uh, the, the free trade zones in Uruguay and Fabrizio, you can... You can help me there. It's it's very very strong and has attracted many companies because they have a stability contract of 30 years that you will not change the rules on the way, and that's what really our countries need to do to give to to the investors and especially to these countries that actually look for long-term investors and they don't like that. Maybe you start with one rule and then two years you have the the labor reform, then the tax reform. So. That's definitely something we, we need to work as a region, not to, how to create more legal stability. Um, Ignacio, uh, complementing uh, about these relationships between Latin America and the GCC countries, how can we strengthen? And, and I know about your, your big knowledge on the renewable energy sector. Um, we will have the COP28, Wagner was mentioning about all this uh, importance we will have with the renewable energy, what we are going to do for, for climate change. So if you can complement about the relations and start speaking about the, um, the environmental uh, mechanisms, financing mechanisms that are available at the bank for the, for the, for the region. Thank you, Maria Camila, so much. On the first thing I want to, well, I'd like to congratulate my panels. I'd like to say something different from what they already said and uh, trying to keep on the audience. I want to congratulate AEM first for having a Latin American session. I think it's very important that we, uh, the moment we only have that map on the left, and I think it's very important to have us today. So thank you so much for Abu Dhabi. For me, Sister Castiglioni, we'll be working so much. But I also want to thank the presence of the Latin American ambassadors uh, here present in Abu Dhabi. On the, um, as you know, I mean, the region is first thing is 33 countries. So I think we go, need to go beyond Latin America, but also mention some opportunities we have in the Caribbean, which is very important for this region, for this part of the world. On the, um, I mean, I would just want to pick up on some numbers that Fabricio mentioned previously on the trade uh, and uh, the opportunities to go beyond uh, on what we already have, no? And before going to the green aspect that you just mentioned, I want to strengthen a couple of opportunities that we do have. First thing, we all, all Latin American and the Caribbean countries are very much interested in trying to move on the sovereign wealth fund of, Abu, of uh, the Emirates into our countries. But at the same time, and we need to find opportunities for them. And those opportunities, as they already mentioned, go into agribusiness first. I mean, GCC imports up to 80% of their food, so therefore you have a huge opportunity for countries, for some countries. I mean. In Latin America and the Caribbean, we do the breakfast, we do the lunch, and we do the meal. This is a huge opportunity for us. At the same time, there are also other ones. We need to move into tourism, for example, textile, sports. I mean, we're all still celebrating what happened in Argentina and nearby, in Qatar. Education is a huge opportunity here in education in, uh, in the Emirates. 
you're having now, I mean, over the last 50 years, you multiply by 200 the gross product in 50 years of this country, but also you multiply and you have nowadays, I think it's uh, up to uh, 1,200 schools, and you also have 73 universities present in these countries. On, the, on defense, and I would like to strengthen as well something that hasn't been mentioned before, is cybersecurity. There's a lot of potentials on digital and cybersecurity. And the, this leads me to what the aspects you were mentioning on, on the green aspect. As you might know, CAF is the, actually, can work on gas sector, on extractive sector. And I think it's very important to notice, and there's a lot of potential for us to work together with the UAE, with the GCC, on extractive industry in the region. Fabricio was mentioning, for example, on the lithium, no? Just for you to know, there's going to be four times more critical meter minerals are needed by now from the 2040. At the same time, energy transition requires or will require up to 40% of copper production, 70% of nickel, and, of course, 90% of lithium. So by 2040, which is not far away, in a couple of years, you're going to be needing to multiply by 13 the amount of lithiums that you need for energy transition. Over the last 5,000 years, I mean, if you go to the Louvre Museum here in Abu Dhabi, you can see all this beautiful exposition. But over the last 5,000 years, we have extracted up to 700 million tons of copper. You're going to be needing the same amount over the next two decades, just for the energy transition. As you were mentioning, we have this huge, uh, and we're all going to be here next uh, by November, December, to celebrate in Dubai the COP28. We're very much eager to know what UAE is going to be a very successful COP, we know. I had meetings yesterday. UAE is working to announce, along with France and with Barbados, a climate change initiative up to $6 billion for the transition to climate change energies. I mean, in our countries, we need to work very much beyond that. It's very important to strengthen that Latin America has the cleanest energy matrix, the cleanest energy matrix of all emerging economies. So we at CAF are developing private and public uh, uh, green instruments, but we need to go beyond that. We need to be creative. And all the banks are actually, we're working on guarantees. We're trying to mobilize public, but also private sector. For every dollar that we mobilize, I mean, that we have at CAF, we're mobilizing right now up to one dollar. But we need to go way beyond. As you might remember, there's an agreement called from Addis Abeba called moving from billion to trillions. So we need precisely private sector leverage, and that's something that we're working on, precisely looking for green growth opportunities. And that goes, of course, in the renewable, in the wind energy sectors in Colombia, on the green in Chile, and of course, we work in gas, so we're also working in Argentina, in Vaca Muerta. That's something that we believe UAE could invest upstream. I mean, I mean upstream is fine, but we need to work more on, the, on those projects. In order to do so, and we believe, we strongly believe that gas, for example, has huge fiscal benefits for the region, but also integration benefits that they were mentioning before. And in order to do so, I was just talking to a few of our colleagues, we need to improve what, you, what the ambassador, what, I'm sorry, the Minister of Paraguay is just precisely working on, which is the agreement on tariff, but also the, tariff, the agreement on protecting investments in the region. So I think it's both ways. We need to do a lot on our side too. That's something that we need to recognize. It's not the GCC countries. There's a lot to do and a lot to do strengthen in Latin America and the Caribbean. And lastly, I just want to stress the knowledge exchange. There's a lot to learn from these countries. There's a lot that we can learn better. CAF, the way I portray CAF, is a huge uh, platform. I think it's the ideal gateway for the global south to meet and where we can exchange and learn from others. Thank you. Thank you. We're struggling with this because we need to hear you with this, then we have to take it off. Um, thank you, Ignacio. And extremely interested about, um, well, the, the, the energy transition, because in our countries we have wind, we have water, we, we can do so much better with, with really high technologies. And we, we really need to work more together between between the, the, the two regions. And actually, we, we were talking, and I mentioned about the new shoring and how to do different supply chains, and it connects with the, actually the energy crisis that we're suffering in, in Europe. And 
as you are based in, in Madrid, you know that in Europe we're having a huge energy crisis, which is not the case in Latin America. Um, we, have, we have plenty of energy, we can do solar. If you are in the equator, the X-rays for the sun outpolders are actually more, more productive by being on the equator. So all this energy transition can really, can really, um, it can be a win-win between the GCC countries and LATAM. And Maria Camille, if, if you want, yeah, I can expand on, sure. on that point. I mean, you know, I think it's been mentioned here. But just La Latin America has <laughs> one of the best resources in terms of renewable energy. Wh whether it's solar, whether it's wind, whether it's hydro, whether it's geothermal. I, I mean, it's, it's all there. Uh, you know, and, and, and there's, there's enough capital to actually fund all of the initiatives in Latin America. The barriers, and actually on, on the capital point, so globally, of all the capital that's being invested in, in infrastructure right now, two-thirds is around green energy, green technologies, trend, energy transition. So, so the capital's there, but where we're seeing the issue in Latin America is more around regulatory clarity, in some cases not as clear as it should be. I mean, some markets are better than others. The other is that there's still an issue with import tariffs because a lot of the panels, a lot of the, the wind turbines come from other countries. There's an issue with the cost of financing because, again, you know, uh, because of where it is and because of where the rates are right now, which you know has been a, is a limitation. Uh, and and there's also issues with transmission that a lot of the Latin American countries, the transmission was never designed to have multiple sort of centers of production. It was all more centralized, and that also needs investment, which tends to be more local, more the, the, the local utilities, as opposed to the foreign investors. Uh, so, so we see some of those bottlenecks. I mean, we're all trying to work through to kind of try to help resolve those, but the capital is there, and the interest is there, especially the companies out of the GCC. Every meeting I've had with the GCC uh, investors in the last 12 months, 18 months, their number one priority is anything around green, anything around renewables, anything around clean tech. So if we can actually you know, make progress in making it more attractive or reducing some of the barriers that they're seeing, because they're, they're real. And, and it's not only Latin America. We, we see some of those same barriers in other parts of the world. So it is really a global issue. Uh, we will attract that capital because they, they want to invest. They have the capital and they have, you know, and, and not only that, they see it as not only producing electricity for the local market, it's what that electricity and energy is going to do for manufacturing, for export, exports, for green hydrogen, for the extraction of uh, you know, rare earth minerals, for the extraction of lithium, for example. So it all, they, they see it from a more strategic, long-term perspective, as you pointed out. They're not thinking about, how can I invest my money, make a good return on it? It's, how will this play in my own economic growth and what I need? to support my economy over the next 30 years. And they have to look at that from that perspective. So to me, you know, the, the desire is there, the capital is there. We just need to you know, help them get over. We need to help ourselves actually address some of these issues and then that capital will flow. So, so I think we're, you know, we're in a golden moment. We just need to be able to grab that and make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> disaster with this thing. Thank you, Jaime. Well, um, excellent point, and, and also about working on the efficiency of, of this renewable energy, because what, some of the complaints I received from the manufacturing sector is, yeah, Camila, it can, it can sound very nice, everything, but the solar panels that we have right now, it doesn't give enough electricity for all the manufacturing that is within the free trade zones. So it's another barrier that we have. So not only the panels, it's the efficiency that they will give um, so that is actually uh, working. So thank, thank you very much. And again, it's the regulatory, no? Always, and, and, and Wagner, um, I don't know if you would like to complement something regarding with the renewable and the regulatory, especially in Brazil. Yes, actually, uh, it's funny because we approved the legal framework for the solar energy two years ago. We, we, we had not. So, uh, it's very interesting what happened with the sector before yeah. it was regulated. It's a 
very impressive, Camila. It's impressive because uh, the, the, the investors uh, were eager to invest, but they, the, they, they just don't have legal security. They, they don't lack, don't, doesn't have, uh, they didn't have a legal certainty to invest. Once the, the legislative branch uh, approved the legal framework, the, the investment came heavily, heavily. So, uh, and, and it happened with the sanitation law, the, the, it, it was exactly the same situation. The, the investors were there, they just want legal certainty to invest. So I think uh, the, the renewables and, and this green economy uh, depend heavily on this new regulation. And, I, and I, uh, it, the, the future, uh, probably in the future, probably we will see a, a, a regulation on the carbon trade and probably the same will happen with the carbon trade. The same will happen with um, uh, uh, hydrogen. Uh, so I think uh, we have uh, many opportunities in, in this area, especially in Brazil. Again, the, the, the productive sector, especially in, in agriculture, but in, in heavy industries too, are feeling the pressure of, from the consumers. They, they uh, need to see uh, our productive uh, sector moving on in a more cleaner and a sustainable uh, production and we are just in the beginning. We will need uh, partners, we will need investors to, to have this shift in our economy and I think uh, it will create uh, many opportunities with a uh, great opportunity to have a new industry. Okay. I Ignacio, you, you wanted to, to complement and, and also if you can give us your perspective from the bank about these different financing me mechanisms you have right now. Gracias. Thank you. Just want to compliment it, but I want to say first thing that in the regions you have institutions just like IDIDB, where Fabrizio is representing, and, my, and CAF, where we're precisely working on regulatory framework, uh, precisely on those sectors, among other things. I want to stress here, there's a couple of things I want to stress. First thing, and taking advantage of the fact that we have uh, Uruguay Ambassador Seriani here, is that, one, it's very important for us, but uh, Ambassador here is co-chairing IRENA. So the, for, for the first time ever, we're going to have an IRENA meeting upcoming now in October, November, Ambassador, and that's going to take place in Uruguay. So that's a very important thing to stress. So hopefully we can have a UAE's presence, hopefully can, we can attract more private sector investments, precisely in this renewable sector. And that's going to be taking place before COP. And I think it's very important that we make a link between the upcoming meeting in Montevideo and the COP in Dubai. So, Ambassador, we praise you and we had full service to assist you in this, uh, in this endeavor of yours. I want to stress a couple of, I mean, you mentioned nearshoring, offshoring, and so on. There's a new concept called power shoring as well, that you all know it's linked to energy. I won't go into more details, but there's also a lot of opportunities that we haven't mentioned here on green hydrogens. I'm sure Jaime has a lot to say on that. On, um, I also want to stress, for example, that we're having a huge country in the region which is growing almost as much as GCC, which is Guyana, probably not on your map, but, and there's a lot to learn precisely from this part of the world for Guyana to build their own sovereign wealth fund in the future. IDB is already working on that. We want to work on that in the future as well. There's a few numbers I want to give you just for our ideas. On nowadays, you're investing one and a half dollar for every dollar you invest in fossil fuels, for in, in, in renewable, one and a half. By 2030, so in a couple of years, you're going to be investing nine dollars in renewables for every dollar you invest in fossil fuels. That gives you the change, no? What we need in the region is the necessary resources. So of course you have development banks that are ready to assist our countries, but we need more. We need private sector. We need to engage more resources that goes beyond Latin America and other wealth funds. Again, I want to go back to what Uruguay did. Uruguay just, just released, with the assistance of IDB among others, a huge green bond, a very massive and very innovative green bond. And that's the kind of uh, innovative instruments where MDBs should be replicating in the region. So we need to find innovative instruments. We work, for example, we have an, uh, within CAF, 
what we call CAF Asset Management, CAFAM. It's present in certain countries. It's actually it's go, it's moving to six countries, to six additional countries now. We're investing in new projects. We're going to be investing in decarbonization project. We're going to be investing in what a new concept called decementing. We had meetings yesterday with UAE precisely on those concepts. We're seeking new opportunities. I think you mentioned before, Fabrizio and Jaime, we have a huge opportunity among the two regions, but we also have to see that the green aspect is actually, and Fabrizio knows so much more than me about this, green is a new tariff for certain regions of the world. So we have to seek an agreement among the two regions, among the GCC and the Latin America and the Caribbean, where green is seen as an opportunity and not as a tariff among the two of us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ignacio. Well, it, it, to be honest, it's the first time I heard power sharing. I heard about French sharing, near sharing, but power sharing, that's, that's a new one for me. And, and you, you remind me in one of the, um, of the conferences I was attending about the green tariff, and they say, well, the old tariff will be like tariff. That old um, tax that was charged between the countries uh, for the exchange of goods. That's our, like, maybe we're, what my uh, son, kid, my, my grandkids will hear. Uh, maybe we're, we're moving more into, into gr these green tariffs, definitely. Um, so very interesting that you mentioned it. Uh, Minister, I would like to, to ask you, um, and, and since you're, you're representing uh, basically today all the, all the all the Mercosur uh, region, South America as well. What are these government, what, 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 should, what measures, specific measures, should governments be taking into account in order to attract investment? And if you can tell us about the recent investment on biofuels that was um, attracted to your, to your country, since I heard is one of the biggest ones that arrived to your country recently. Voy a comenzar de, con un enfoque general y con la experiencia que ha tenido mi país a partir de un proceso eh, que ha hecho que tengamos un punto de inflexión en nuestra historia económica hace 19 años. El Paraguay decidió cambiar su historia decidió cambiar su historia y lo hizo de común acuerdo, no solamente el, no lo hizo el sector del gobierno, sino lo hizo con un acuerdo amplio con la sociedad civil, con las fuerzas vivas, en donde hemos decidido iniciar un proceso de profundas reformas estructurales que apuntaban a darle a la economía paraguaya modernidad, formalización, eficiencia, eficacia, y que se empiece a construir un espacio de oportunidades. Esa experiencia ha hecho que tengamos en este momento, aquí le tengo como testigo a Fabricio Perti, también a, a mi amigo, el representante de la CAF, que manejan datos muy concretos, esas profundas reformas iniciales en el ámbito de la estructura fiscal que luego fueron reproduciéndose en, en reformas de segunda y tercera generación han hecho que en este momento mi país tenga la macroeconomía más confiable y estable de prácticamente toda Latinoamérica. Tenemos una política monetaria que es una política de Estado que ubica al signo monetario, monetario del Paraguay prácticamente como el signo monetario más estable junto con el dólar en las últimas décadas. Tenemos un sistema financiero que ha pasado todo tipo de exámenes, el último de ellos del Gafilat, con creces, con suficiencias, y se ha convertido en un sistema financiero confiable. Tenemos un clima económico que según el ranking establecido por un think tank 
muy reconocido en Latinoamérica, la Getulio Vargas, respetado en Latinoamérica y respetado en buena parte del mundo, ha ubicado al Paraguay por tercer año consecutivo como el país con mejor clima económico. Tenemos en este año un, una proyección de crecimiento del Producto Interno Bruto del 5.2% relatado por, proyectado por el Fondo Monetario y por el Banco Mundial. Cuando que en, la América, en América Latina el promedio va a ser alrededor de 1.6%. Vamos a ser el país que más vamos a crecer en América del Sur. Hablo de experiencias concretas, de qué hemos hecho nosotros para que Paraguay sea un país de oportunidades para radicar inversiones. Y hemos tenido éxitos. Hemos tenido éxitos permanentes. La radicación de inversión extranjera directa en los últimos, los últimos lustros ha sido continua, al punto tal que en tiempo de pandemia, Paraguay fue uno de los cinco países de Latinoamérica que logró acrecentar la inversión extranjera directa. En tiempo de pandemia, acrecentamos 9%, cuando que a nivel global la disminución de la, extranjera, la inversión extranjera directa fue del 34%. En Europa, por ejemplo, fue del 80%. En Estados Unidos, 40%. En Latinoamérica, 45%. En Sudamérica, 54%. Y aumentó Paraguay 9%. Eso habla de una estrategia que ha consolidado confianza para albergar inversiones de todo el mundo. Entonces, hablo un poco de la experiencia exitosa de un país que se esforzó en cambiar su economía, de volver su economía cada vez más competitiva, de volver su economía, de tornar su, de, a su economía a la adopción de estándares que nos permiten ingresar a los mejores mercados. Entonces... Con todo esto, con una experiencia exitosa que hace que estemos creciendo permanentemente, que estemos acogiendo inversiones, es que venimos a esta parte del mundo. Venimos al Golfo a decirles, es posible crecer juntos. Nosotros estamos creciendo ordenadamente. Hay un presupuesto, y tengo que decir aquí, como una autocrítica a toda la región latinoamericana. Yo soy latinoamericano, aquí con mis compañeros, la mayoría somos latinoamericanos. Necesitamos ser previsibles. Necesitamos tener sistemas confiables y previsibles. Nadie va a un lugar donde no hay previsibilidad. Nadie invierte en un lugar de no, no se, donde, donde no haya previsibilidad y no haya certeza de la continuidad de modelos de desarrollo. Entonces, necesitamos construir en América Latina modelos previsibles modelos que den certeza a la gente que quiera ir a, a invertir. Eso le hemos venido a decir aquí a Emiratos Árabes Unidos. Acabo de sostener una reunión con mis colaboradores, con ADQ, uno de los principales fondos inversores. Y le hemos dicho, vayan a mi país, vayan a Latinoamérica y vayan a mi país. Ahí van a encontrar muchas oportunidades en todas las áreas para invertir. Y fundamentalmente lo van a hacer con un modelo de desarrollo económico que se ha desarrollado con nuestras características, pero que en este momento es un modelo alabado por el presidente del Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo, por las autoridades del Fondo Monetario Internacional, porque hemos logrado construir un ambiente de previsibilidad, un modelo de desarrollo que da previsibilidad a toda la gente que pueda confiar en nosotros. Entonces, yo creo que fundamentalmente para ser un país amigable para acoger inversiones, para establecer negociaciones concretas con esta parte del mundo, que para ellos somos gran parte todavía desconocidos, y que tenemos un potencial enorme para crecer en inversiones. Tenemos en este momento, ¿cuánto? 16 mil millones de dólares, por un lado. Pero el potencial es enorme. Pero para ello necesitamos desarrollar iniciativas concretas, país por país, y también necesitamos desarrollar iniciativas como bloques. Nosotros estamos en este momento decididos en el MERCOSUR a tratar de llegar a un acuerdo MERCOSUR con 
Emiratos Árabes Unidos. Esa es una estrategia... Esa es una estrategia que va a abrir un enorme campo y va a producir sinergia, no solamente a partir de un país, va a producir sinergia con otros países del, del Golfo. Creo que ese es el camino, Mo, modelos de desarrollo que produzcan confianza, previsibles, que se extiendan en el tiempo, modelos de desarrollo que ofrezcan estabilidad en sus sistemas económicos, modelos de desarrollo en donde los inversionistas y los fondos que vayan, por ejemplo, de esta parte del mundo allá, vayan con certeza de ganar dinero. ¿Para qué se van los fondos a nuestra región? ¿Para ganar dinero? Claro que van para ganar dinero. Y a nosotros nos interesa que vayan a ganar dinero. ¿Saben por qué? Porque si ellos ganan dinero ahí, ayudan a crear riqueza en nuestros países, ayudan a crear trabajo y empleo, y por lo tanto ayudan a crear dignidad a nuestra familia, a la familia de nuestro pueblo. Es un negocio redondo, es win-win. Todos ganamos y eso lo podemos producir en un ambiente sinérgico con estas iniciativas, sin conservadurismo, atreviéndonos a avanzar rápidamente en los procesos. Nosotros en, en dos años logramos tener todos estos acuerdos. Y ahora hablamos ayer con mi colega, y con todos, el presidente Mirato Arba está decidido a llevar adelante el proceso del Mercosur y yo también te soy muy optimista. Yo creo que con nuestros hermanos de Argentina, de Brasil, de Uruguay, vamos a llegar en poco tiempo a tener este acuerdo que va a abrir y que va a ser un modelo para otras partes del mundo. Así que yo soy muy optimista y, y tengo, tengo la plena confianza y la certeza de que vamos a hacer un modelo de relacionamiento entre América Latina y esta parte del mundo. Gracias, Ministro. Creo que a todos nos impregnó el optimismo, sí. eh, definitivamente. Eh, y, y lo que menciona, ¿no? Previsibilidad, predictability, yes. definitivamente. Y lo que nosotros estamos trabajando desde, desde la Asociación de Zonas Francas de las Américas es también regionalización. Así Porque es. definitivamente cada país solo por cada lado es, es. es mucho más débil que si estuviéramos eh, trabajando como región y ahí la importancia de, de instituciones como CAF y BIT eh, en pro de, de unir todos los esfuerzos de nuestros países. Y bueno, celebramos eh, el, el, el anuncio de, del Mercosur con, el, con los países del Golfo. Bueno, eh, ¿cuánto nos quedan? ¿Diez? Iba a hablar de servicios, ¿no? Sí, no, 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 ahí no, ahí no, pero quería. Bueno, um, Fabricio, I would... Ay, no, ¿por qué me puse esto? Um, Fabricio, I would, I would like to ask you, now moving uh, to the service sector, and, and Ignacio briefly uh, touched based on that, especially on the cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and knowing all your experience in knowledge-based services, and everything that we have in our, in our region, uh, BPO, KPO, ITO, um, If you, if you can tell us what are you seeing in the region, how we can strengthen with this part of the region since we have been visiting different free trade zones and one of the, bay of, of the most important is actually attracting the talent. And I think we have a lot of talent in our region. So if you, if you can uh, tell us more about the service sector and how to strengthen between both regions. Sure, Maria Camila, thank you for the question. I fully support uh, ministers <laughs> uh, Castiglione's optimism uh, and opportunities. I'd like to do a call to action. We've identified the opportunities, okay? But many of you, especially the, the companies, the players from the GCC, from this region, are saying, okay, this is a land of opportunities, of passionate people. They really, you know, have something out there, that value proposition. They have energy, they have food, they have the demographics. So how do we do it? And that's, I'd like to say a little bit about the Inter-American Development Bank. Because investment promotion, one dollar in put in investment promotion generates $56. So 
just imagine how useful that is. We worked with Paraguay, with ReadyX, for a very long time. Yeah. We did an, a huge investment forum in Paraguay. We worked with Brazil. We have the Brazil Investment Forum coming up in Sao Paulo. We did it six times already in Mexico eh, throughout eh, different events. So we work with ProMexico, now with the Minister of Economy. So if you need to talk to the investment promotion agencies, to the ministers of industry and trade, come to us. We have projects in every country. We have resources in execution. For what? For soft landing. So when you get to the airport, you need, you need information on the regulatory framework, on contacts, on suppliers, on, on how to do the paperwork, all of that, which the investment promotion agencies and the ministries of economic affairs and international relations are there to support, and, and the IDBs as well. So I just wanted to let you know that you, you're not alone in this process. You have, you have uh, the partners talking about services. The rebound of FDI after the pandemic in, in Latin America and the Caribbean was propelled by the services sector. Actually, in, it was a record number in 2021 of 317 greenfield projects in information and communications technology. And we're talking about animation, video games, software, production of films, architecture, engineering, business process outsourcing, knowledge process outsourcing, a myriad of services that are there and in which joint ventures are happening and in which we are supporting. And what do we do? Things that we do. In my country, in Uruguay, we took MIT, you know, and thinking about the universities in this region, if they want to set up shop in Latin America. We took the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the MIT, to do a program in data science, to generate the entrepreneurs of the future eh, that will export their services around the world. After three years, 300 um, young people graduated from that program with MIT and the Technological University of Uruguay. 65 companies were generated, all global companies. So uh, thinking about the education sector, and it was mentioned here, um, there's an opportunity, undoubtedly, uh, to set up shop in the region with the universities, with the schools. Then, uh, with our projects, uh, BAF, the German, huge plastics company, wanted to set up shop in, in Uruguay as well. We did a finishing school. So it's a public-private uh, uh, partnership in which the company, the investor, so if you're investing and you need training, you put the content and the government gets the people, goes and gets the people the, from the universities, from the colleges, brings them, and the IDB funds those programs. We do them everywhere. We're, we're, we're doing uh, in, in Jamaica in, in June, outsourced to LAC, a huge investment forum on services on the technology sector. It's the 10th edition. We started a long time ago in 2011, and that's growing exponentially, all of that. So we also carry out many of these events in, in this specific sector. We have a huge project in Colombia, in your country, and that is very successful. It's a, it's a, it's a sector, the digital, that is growing, and the problem is the people, the human capital. That's the main barrier. There's not enough people. There's not enough people in Silicon Valley as well. There's full employment in Silicon Valley. So it's not a, just a problem of developing countries. It's a problem uh, everywhere. Um, so that those updated skills with the investment promotion agencies, talking to the investors are key. And if you want to continue this conversation of opportunities, I very much welcome you to join connectamericas.com. Connectamericas.com is a platform, an online platform, business to business. We launched that with, with Facebook, with DHL and other partners. It grew exponentially. We have 16 million users from 200 countries. It's free. And if you want to discover opportunities in Latin America, we welcome to, to join connectamericas.com. So that, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, so we're doing, we're very active in the region uh, and, and taking those opportunities into action because there's not enough time. Uh, we are over-diagnosed. Uh, we know the opportunities. We have to execute them. Uh, and, and that's what we're all about. I like your term of overdiagnosed, <laughs> and and actually, Fabrizio, you 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 remind me that 
Now, one of the biggest challenge for countries is how to attract talent. Before it was how to attract investment, these big companies, but companies are based on people. So now the big question is how to attract talent. And I think here we have many examples. They even have the happiness center. We're working with the global nomads, the digital nomads. Exactly. In Mexico, actually, in Uruguay, and in Buenos Aires as well. Uh, the digital nomads, these you know, this young people, creative, that want to work from anywhere uh, and they need a certain service. The Uruguay just launched last week uh, the digital uh, nomads platform with Uruguay 21. So yeah, How human capital, that's the key. And the key. Latin America, it's a great place to live. Eh? It's a great place to work and uh, it's very fun. Uh, so that's also a very important thing. Very green, good weather. <laughs> Great, well, th this has been fantastic. And to close, I would like to ask each, in one minute or less, the takeaway. Like, what is your takeaway message for this audience? Okay, Minister? Minister? <laughs> Latinoamérica es una gran oportunidad para esta parte de la región del mundo, para los países del Golfo. Definitivamente quiero repetir, Latinoamérica es una región de oportunidades para los países del Golfo. Debemos conocernos más para que esas oportunidades florezcan en procesos concretos de crecimiento mutuo de ambas regiones. Tenemos economías plenamente complementarias. Tenemos fondos, empresas y empresarios que están dispuestos a trabajar de manera conjunta estableciendo joint ventures. Tenemos dos regiones que tienen un gran potencial en distintas, de distintas maneras, pero que tenemos que unirlos. El gran desafío es profundizar el conocimiento que tenemos el uno del otro. Estamos avanzando en ese sentido. Este evento del cual estamos participando, ya yo creo que ya estuve en dos oportunidades, y Fabricio y todos los demás, es un evento magnífico para ayudarnos a profundizar nuestro conocimiento mutuo. Y al mismo tiempo, a la medida de conocernos, emprender acciones concretas. ADQ va a estar en, en Paraguay en seis o siete semanas. Ya es una acción concreta. Uno de los grandes fondos que invierten en distintas partes del mundo y también ya ha empezado a invertir en parte de Latinoamérica, va a aterrizar en mi país. Va a encontrarse con el país de oportunidades. Vamos a producir sinergia. Vamos a empezar a hacer negocios. ¿Por qué? porque nos estamos conociendo y estamos ganando confianza. Ese es el camino, profundizar nuestro relacionamiento, conocernos, abrir un campo de oportunidades y hacer que nuestras empresas y nuestros empresarios trabajen conjuntamente en Joint Ventures, creando oportunidades aquí como plataforma y en la región latinoamericana como plataforma. Aquí el negocio es win-win. Todos tenemos que ganar. Tienen que ganar los gobiernos, pero fundamentalmente como producto de la ganancia del relacionamiento económico que nosotros vamos a tener, tiene que ganar nuestra gente, que es lo más importante. Mil gracias, Ministro. Fabricio. Eh, just briefly, land of opportunities. We have what you need. We have the biodiversity. We have the energy transition with our critical minerals. We have the food. We have the demographics with the young people for the digitalization. Uh, so I think, you know, we have to do, we have to take this event to Latin America. We have to generate more opportunities for trade and invest. We have to do more people-to-people -people exchanges. Uh, I think the development banks like CAF, like IDB, fulfill an, an essential role because we continue. The governments come and go. Some are more stable yeah. than others, like Paraguay <laughs> and like Uruguay <laughs> and others. Uh, but uh, the IDB is there. We have been around since 1959 and we are there to stay. So use us. Let's partner together. Uh, the opportunities are there and, uh, you know, the people are noticing. Thank you. Jaime. Oh, yeah. So, partner. 
as, as I said earlier, I mean, you know, GCC has been taking small steps in entering Latin America. So we're at that cusp. And as I said earlier, you know, we're at that golden moment where now we can actually make it happen and create that sort of snowball effect. Uh, but, you know, we have to also recognize that we're not the only region coming to GCC and looking for capital, looking for trade, looking for stronger relationships. So we have competition. So we need to make sure that as the private sector and as governments, we work together to reduce those impediments and those barriers to make it more attractive vis-a-vis -vis somewhere else. Otherwise, you know, they have options. And, you know, it, it, Latin America will continue to be important for GCC, but we want to make sure that it's extremely important. And the other thing I would add is that we need to be bold. I mean, I think, you know, Latin America, if you look at kind of what's happened in the last 10 or 15 years, is our companies have gone global. So we're now global competitors. We now supply globally. You know, uh, our entrepreneurs now actually are establishing, you know, billion dollar companies, which was never the case. Uh, and there's a lot of money pouring into a lot of consumer uh, sectors, a lot of tech sectors. All that, you know, tells us that, you know, we, we can compete in a, in a global market. From an investment perspective, I can tell you that 10 years ago, almost all the capital that was coming into Latin America, private capital, was by foreign companies. Today, you know, we and several other investors are now some of the biggest investors in Latin America. We compete with anyone in the world. So I think Latin America can compete with anyone in the world to get capital and trade with the Gulf countries. And we should take that opportunity to do that. Thank you, Jaime. Wagner. Yeah, Jaime, it's very interesting what you said about the competition for the investment. And we, we saw this in daily basis with our clients. We saw uh, how they comparing regions, they compare, they compare uh, uh, countries and, uh, uh, you know, reduce these barriers is a challenge for us. Stability is a challenge for us. Uh, the, the, the lack of uh, capabilities in the labor, uh, you know, sector is very important for us to, 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 to address. But I think right now, as you mentioned to you, it's a, it's a very special moment. I see in now countries here, there, there is a, a, a clear vision that uh, this is the moment to attract this investment because this green transition uh, is happening right now. And I think uh, many countries in the world are looking for Latin America as a place or to, to find a supplier or to invest. So I think the idea to have a broad uh, agreement between uh, Mercosur uh, and the GCC or uh, UAE, it's a great idea. Uh, of course, uh, probably the minister already talked about that with another minister in, in the region, so uh, this is very interesting to, to to, to see this here. And here in, in BMJ, we are at our entire disposal for, for any company that may want to, to understand more the region, more the Brazilian region uh, uh, and the opportunities. And, you know, as we saw in the past, we can change what is not working. We can change legislation. We can, we can improve our legal framework. So, we are open to that. I, I would like to thank you the opportunity. And uh, again, it's very good to see how the, this, this space is growing and the interest for Latin America is growing too. Thank you. Thank you, Wagner. Ignacio. Thank you, Maria I'm going to be quick and finish quickly. I think, I mean, we all speak on a regular basis. I think this is the first panel I've been in a long time where no one mentioned pandemia. So I like the optimism. I like the boldness that uh, Jaime mentioned. I think I'd like to finish on a very high note. I want to praise Mr. Castiglione, not only because he's finishing his term on a very high note, uh, and even more mentioning the Mercosur, upcoming Mercosur agreement with the GCC. Let's hope that it's going to be, it's going to take much less with the other geographies that we all focus on, European ones. So we want to be on that note. There's a reality is that we, at the region, we're not growing much. Uh, you mentioned 1.4, I believe. 
over the last 10 years we've grown very little in the region, even less than in La Década Perdida over the 80s. But we need this optimism that we, uh, and this, uh, the boldness that you were all mentioning, that Fabricio was stressing. I think what we can do is IDB and CAF, just to finish, we're both gateways, we're platforms, we want to be facilitators, we want to bring more UAE in Paraguay at with ADQ, we want to bring more opportunities in the region overall, and we're here to work with you, and we're going to be present here for the COP. I just want to finish saying that we're going to be hosting at the COP in Dubai a Latin American and Caribbean pavilion, and we're hopefully going to be bringing more investment opportunities, green investment for the region. Thank you. Thank you, Ignacio. Well, just summary um, up the, the main points after all this brilliant panel. Win-win. Um, moderator. <laughs> Win-win. Yes. Knowing, knowing us more between us. Yes. We have what you need. Yes. Call to action. Yes. I think this is homework for Astrid. <laughs> An all investment meeting in Latin America. Creating the value proposition as a region. Great moment, gold moment. We need boldness. And, and to finish, Ignacio, um, th this was great. Is here you can reach any country in Latin America, just with any of us. You can reach any country, any institution, any minister that you would like for investing in our region. So thank you very much. This has been... Thank you very much. No, thank you. Maria Camila. Thank you, Maria Camila. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Muy wow. Bien. What a brilliant moment we have just all witnessed. I'm so very excited and happy and proud of every single one of our panelists. Because it has been full of knowledge, full, full of insightfulness for all of us here at the audience. I see all of the community, the Latin American community, uh, the public sector, the, the private sector, the diplomats that have been working for years in building these relationships between Latin America and GCC countries. But the work is just beginning. And as you can see, there are an, a, a lot of uh, tasks that we have to make in the next few months, in the next few years, in order to, like all the panelists says, make this happen make this happen. We have to make this happen and bring this investment that is so needed in Latin America, but also the trade. But in the, the, the only way to, de to do it is to remember, always remember that these regions are not that different as we think. The language may be different, the religion may be different, the distance may be very, very long, and well, the time zones are also a challenge when, we, when you're doing business. You all know what I'm talking about. You, all the way, you have all uh, lived through that, all these challenges. But I think we are able to tackle them while we work together, as this panel has shown, the private sector, the public sector, and all this uh, red tape can be eliminated, and all these regulatory uh, changes that are needed can happen because the, uh, the stars are aligning for us in this moment, and it's very exciting to see that this uh, exciting panel has, uh, ha has given us uh, important tools and very specific tasks to be made. So please expect annual investment meeting for Latin America next year, and inshallah, hopefully, we will have the collaboration of all the actors that we have here that I'm very grateful that you accepted to, to join us in, in this year's edition of the annual investment meeting. And thank you all for being here with us in this very, very special day. Thank you and have a great day.